Welcome to the eight critical drivers uh, to RTO Success Masterclass. In this masterclass, we will be covering leadership and team, which is an area that's very important within any organisation and in particular within an RTO and what you need to have in place in order to make sure that you actually have a functioning team. And particularly when we get really busy, which is where we are getting right now with a lot of the government funding that is out there right now and what is available for your training, um, we need to make sure that we're keeping on top of our team and making sure that we're also managing our own leadership. Okay, so my goal today is to serve quality training organisations to grow and scale, which is what all of these eight critical drivers is all about. It's all about growing and scaling your business and making sure that you have the most success within your business. So today you're working on your business and I want you to be really focused on the webinar that we are delivering today and make sure that you're making this webinar your priority for the next 90 minutes. So turn your phone on to mute, turn off your emails and place a do not disturb sign up because you are going to be focused on this webinar. So I'd like to know what is your biggest challenge within your team at the moment? Um, and if you are able to pop it in the chat, I'd love to hear where are the challenges and what is it that you would like to have resolved within your team? Because that's the big thing that we're really focused on today is how can we um, help you with your with your team and your leadership. So I'll just see if we have anybody who would like to participate. <laughs> if not, we'll move on. Um, but I'd love to hear what they are. So the eight critical drivers is all around different drivers to help your business to grow and scale. And today we're going to be going through leadership and team. The key to a great team is a great leader. So that's what we will be focusing on today is those leadership skills. So our objective is to understand how to develop your leadership qualities within yourself, using wisdom and understanding to lead others and making sure that you have a successful team and learn how to trust others and earn their trust. This famous question came down to us from Niccolo Machiavelli, a political theorist who lived in Italy during the Renaissance. He contended that a leader who is feared is preferable to a leader who is loved. However, he also lived during a time of political instability where city governments changed in a flash, usually violently and usually involving executions of the previous leadership. Since we no longer live in an age where stepping down from a leadership position or being removed would involve the loss of one's head, do we really need to adopt the route that proved so disastrous and such ruthless dictators as Saddam Hussein and Augusto Pinchot? So we really are looking at how do we be a better leader? Do should we be loved or should we be feared? So there are different cases for love and fear. So the case of fear is authoritarian, uh, being in control, having boundaries and tough love. So an authorita authoritarian approach to leadership is not all bad. Some people in leadership positions might still maintain that leaders who approach their employees with a sense of antagonism, have fewer instances where employees take advantage of them. They can use tough love to whip employees into shape, where supervisors who aim for popularity fail in setting boundaries for their employees. So it's really important that we look at the approach of how we are managing as a leader and what are we doing to set clear boundaries and well-defined consequences for crossing them. This approach to leadership seldom suffers from employees taking liberties or taking advantage of perceived weaknesses from the supervisor. The other case is for love. 
So where, well, that's, there's a case that's not quite um, being authoritarian, making sure that you scare your employees and they will treat you with respect and dare not to cross you. This has been a great training session. So what we actually see is that the case for love is respecting others. Real respect must be earned and generally care for your employees. And it's really looking at uncovering the instances where they were too afraid to approach you or squashing conflicts with your employees that might tend to flare up when you approach your leadership role from an authoritarian standpoint. Perhaps being loved is not such as useless approach to an effective leadership. So there are two cases, love, the love leaders might be popular, but they might also be easily manipulated. So this can be um, an area, and I have actually seen that, where you might, and I've experienced it as well, where you put love into your team and how you manage your team, but then you're taken advantage of. And that can be um, a very hard decision to make within an, uh, your organisation is making sure that you have that balance between you know, managing your team, but also showing empathy and building that team. The fear environment is marked by fear that may turn into a poisonous environment. And this means time that might otherwise be productively spent is now redirected towards training new employees. So any efficiency such as a leader hoped to gain by cracking the whip has been lost when employees won't stay for a long le length of time. That might be a really good middle ground that we can work on. So the middle ground is setting clear boundaries and understanding and valuing your employees. Since both leadership styles have both upsides and downsides, perhaps the better approach is to be a little of both. Like an authoritative leader, you want to have clear boundaries with your clear consequences, but you do not want to create a fearful and poisonous environment where everyone is trying to stab each other in the back and no one will tell you the truth, but whatever you want to hear. In addition, a middle ground approach would mean that you do value employees as people. You are generally interested in their lives and you understand that respect is a two-way street within that must be earned. Yet you impose clear boundaries. While you and your employees may be equal in both personal and possibly even a professional sense, you have a different job than your employees. You face a different set of pressures within your business and within the organization. The key to understanding whether it's better to be loved or feared is considering the big picture and the long term. And in each situation, which approach would be more effective in the long run for that situation? Whether you prefer an authoritative approach to leadership style or a lenient one, or something in between, one factor that can truly enhance your effectiveness as a leader is to see yourself as serving others. And that includes your employees on your team and the needs of your company and your organization. Often these two sets of needs will coincide. The needs of your employees are the needs of a well-run organization. When they do contradict, seeing yourself as a kind of a servant to your employees can help you better weigh your priorities to both the long and the short term. So leadership should be a service to not only your employees, but also your whole organization. And what you do to grow and scale your business is part of that with, when you focus on leadership as a service within your organization. So there are di disadvantages and advantages to top-down hierarchies. So when we look at the disadvantage, the potential for power-based politics is, is um, very big within an organization. And employees at the bottom can often feel less important. If you have a weak leader, you'll also have a weak organization. And we have seen this when we look at like, different approaches in different organizations. You can see where there's weak leadership. It can come down through the organization. 
Um, and for example, we've experienced this recently with ASQA um, and looking at the leadership style within ASQA and how that affected the whole audit process and then also how it affected the whole industry. Um, and you can really see that. And even if we look at uh, something like in going into politics and looking at Trump and looking at his leadership style and how that came down and worked through the uh, whole political structure. So information from management and higher ups is prone to distortion when we have a top down hierarchy. Both management and employees can have a poor understanding of what other groups deal with. So the advantages is you always know who is in charge and who is to report to. Decision making is very efficient and advancement up the career ladder is clearly defined for the team. So they have a really good understanding of where you can work within a team. So when we look at the lateral approach, um, which is an alternative to the tradition of a vertical organizational structure, is looking at the horizontal structure. In this structure, the different departments are administered by project managers who report to an upper management and serve a conduit between the team and the administrators. This approach has its own pros and cons. The advantages are this approach tends to reinforce creativity and innovation because employees are more willing to take risks when they are known, it, when they know that they won't lose the status in doing so. The organization can better adapt to changes in circumstances because communication um, is not, not uh, filtered through different uh, levels of within the organization. Employees have a greater feeling of having a stake within your organization. Employees also have a greater sense of belonging within a team when they have, when you empower them to make decisions and to also empower them within their role. Um, and it get, gives a greater sense of autonomy within the organization. There are so many advantages to having a team that's more of a horizontal approach within um, your organization. The disadvantages is, is when something goes wrong, the lack of a clear structure can lead to blaming of different teams and departments. Decision making can be a slow process and the lack of authoritarian supervisors can lead to an undisciplined and chaotic work environment. Transitions from vertical to horizontal organizational structures can be very difficult because those used to or who are used to authoritarian management styles find it difficult to adjust to seeing co-workers as their peers. So it's really looking at you as a leader, how can you ensure that you are managing your team, um, but looking at it from a co collaborative approach. And this is also coming about within um, ASQA, when we look at ASQA and what their new model is all about. They're looking at a collaborative approach with working with RTOs. And this is something that we can do within our organization. And I think there are a lot of RTOs who do currently deliver training um, and look at their organization as a whole collaborative approach within their organization. And we've seen the success of RTOs that work more on a collaborative approach within their organization. Regardless of what your organizational structure is, um, to lead effectively helps to know your employees on a personal and professional level. Obviously, when you have a larger organization, the former can be very difficult than the latter. But as we know, with a lot of RTOs, we tend to be a smaller organization. This is where it's really important when you do have a bigger organization is make sure that you've got smaller teams that are working more effectively together um, as, the, on the, as those teams. So know your employees on a personal and professional level and understand what it's like to work on the front lines and address each person as an individual. Genuine empathy and the power to lead. This is really important as a team leader is looking at how can you ensure that you are considering your own attitude when you're working with, with your team and looking at the different viewpoints uh, within the team members. 
Brian Brown Walker's comment on the I Ching offers some excellent advice about leadership. Gentleness and understanding create in others an unconscious willingness to be led. When you can genuinely understand where your employees are coming from, you are able to know exactly what to do and to get the best results from your team. This requires developing your own capacity for empathy. Here are some suggestions for developing your own empathy. Listen. You may not always understand where your employees are coming from. Even the most creative and open-minded of people can fail to grasp another individual's unique circumstances. Consequently, the only way you can understand where, you're, uh, where others are coming from is listening to them. Listening to them with a sense of not merely listening to the words of the person, but also listening to the underlying needs that the person may be expressing, even while failing to articulate this. Validate, particularly in times where people seem to be, be far apart in their beliefs. It's really easy to look at a person with whom you disagree and see as an enemy. However, we all have the capacity to feel the same types of emotions, whether that be fear, anger, or joy. We also have the same basic needs. When you try to understand that beneath the disagreement are two people who need love and respect, and it's not so easy to see someone you disagree with as an enemy. Consider your own attitude. When you find yourself in a disagreement with someone, ask yourself what you want from this interaction. Do you want to see the other person punished? Is this about winning or being right? Wanting to see another person punished presumes that you know best, a dangerously arrogant attitude, especially from a leader who should be looking to serve their employees can be detrimental if you take the wrong approach. Suspend your own viewpoint. When you are trying to understand another person's feelings, your own viewpoint isn't necessarily the same perspective. In fact, it gets in the way of seeing another person's view. Remember that suspending your views is not the same as dropping them or changing them. Your viewpoint is still there. It's just understanding the other's viewpoint. Leadership by design. So few people are actually born to be leaders. And often when we start an RTO or get into an RTO, we don't actually consider the fact, and this can be any business, we don't actually consider the fact that we are becoming leaders when we are working within an organisation. We look at all the other sides of the business and what you need to have in place within that business. And um, unfortunately, what can happen is we may not be ready to be leaders. So most people have to learn how to become good leaders. And it's really applying empathy as a leader and making sure that you understand who are your team and who you're working with within your team. So begin with the end in mind. Having a plan means that you know what the end result should look like. This can apply to your work environment, the culture, or what you expect from your employees. By having a clear idea of what you want from your employees and what you want from yourself, you can put yourself in a better position to plan how to meet your goals. And when you have the team on your side, they actually understand what your goals are and what you want to achieve. And in particular, when we're looking at our strategic planning and we're looking at the forecast of where we want to be within our business, we want to have the team on the side when we're looking at those goals. So when we are setting goals, we really need to be uh, really look at specific, measurable, achievable, realistic and time targeted goals. So in addition to company goals, each leader of a team should have specific goals for their team that complement the company goals. These goals can inform how you make policy and what kind of team culture you foster. If you have ever been involved in team meetings and working with teams, you know what it's like when you're trying to conduct a meeting and you haven't got everyone on, on side and they don't understand what or the organization goals are or what your goals are. So 
what you really need to look at is whenever you're involved with these meetings or teams, building exercises that have and seem to be fun, but ultimately pointless or waste your time. You can understand the need within your team of what you want to achieve uh, through that team. So when we set SMART goals, we're really looking at what it specifically are the goals for your team rather than general goals. You are far more likely to follow through when it's specific. Measurable, one of the reasons why uh, people uh, make goals measurable is so that you can measure the success of achieving that goal. So how are you going to measure it? And what are the things that you need to put in place to measure that goal? And the important aspect of beginning with the end in mind. Achievable, if a goal is too easy, it can also be easy to justify giving up on, on it because it's not important enough. Make sure you set your goals for your team that are challenging but achievable. Be realistic. While being ambitious can help you to achieve large goals, being too ambitious can often lead to rebellion, both in your team and in yourself. And I know I've seen this with when we're setting our uh, high value activities and looking at the rocks that you set for your priorities. Sometimes you can make them too high and too hard to achieve. We want to actually be able to achieve these goals and be, be realistic with what we can achieve. Time targeted. When you decide on setting a goal, you must also decide on when you expect your team to achieve that goal. You must be specific and realistic and also look at um, what allows you to organize your goal achieving behavior within a deadline and how can you make sure that it's achievable within that time frame. In addition to being smart about a goal setting, there are also some other steps you can take which can help you to remain committed to achieving your goals. Tell other people on your team what those goals are. And that's why we set these high value activities is so that when you set those goals, you're actually held accountable. And that's what we do with you in the masterminds as our members. Um, we're, we're holding you accountable to achieving those goals. Um, and when you voice it and actually put it out there, other people will also keep you accountable and keep you committed. When appropriate, divide your team goals into smaller milestones. When you collectively reach a milestone, reward your team. Small rewards can help your team to stay enthusiastic. If your team fails to meet a milestone, don't use it as an occasion to beat them up, self, beat them up or yourself up um, is, and, or give up. Instead, determine where you, and how you failed and how to avoid doing so in the future. And most importantly, don't give up. It might be a matter of redefining the goal and identifying what are um, the benefits that you'll get from achieving this goal. And perhaps the most single, most important step is to choose a goal that is meaningful to you and your team. And most importantly, the goals that you have set for your annual priorities with, for your whole organization. <coughs> oh, just go grab some water. So if you've got some water there, please grab some. So how do you determine the values of your organization? Setting goals for yourself and your team. In some cases, your company are important aspects of developing your plan for your leadership. However, on another level, these goals are actually not as big picture as you can get. To really understand how you can lead others, you must account for your own values and the company values as well. When you have a good grasp of what is important to you and what is important to your organization, this can clarify when to stand your ground and when to relent when you disagree with others, which is a position you will find yourself in often as a leader. Values are not the same as morals and ethics. In fact, what you value is both unique to you and to others, and they can change over time. How can you know what you value? The following steps can help you to identify one of the, um, identify these unique steps that you can implement into your organization. Identify 
one of your happiest moments in your life? Who were you with? What were you doing? What factors contributed to your happiness? I really want you to think about that right now and write that down. Put these down in notes of what is it? So think about the happiest moment in your life. Who were you with and what did you achieve? And what, what were the factors that made you happy? Another one is to identify one of your proudest moments in your life. Was this a shared experience? Who was it with? What elements in the experience made it, made you feel proud? Identify one of your most fulfilling moments in your life. Rather than a happiest moment, this could be when you felt the greatest sense of satisfaction. What need was fulfilled? When you work on determining your core values for yourself personally, but also for your organization, you can identify what are, how you work and what you want within your organization. And these can be anywhere between five to 10 values that you have within your organization. At Vivacity, we have five values that we have within our organization. We have above and beyond, quality over quantity. Um, we also have open and honest, ethical integrity, and we also have fun, fair and flexible within our organization. This is how I like to work. And it's also how we recruit our team is on the values. So these values are very important to me, but the team that I've recruited is also around these values. And that's why like, we live our values within our organization. Do you live with your values within your organization? Have you set values for your organization? And if you have, do your team know what your values are within your organization? If you haven't done this uh, exercise yet within your organization and within your team, I highly recommend that you do because it will define who you are within your organization and also who your team are and recruit on those values. This is something that's really important that we have identified that helps you to grow and scale your business. Because when you have your team on your side, it helps you to grow and scale that business because they are on the same page as you. Do you have a mission statement for your organization? Imagine you are somehow able to listen in at your funeral, what will everyone say about you? What would you like to be said about you? Now that you have taken time to identify some specific goals and some core values, the next step is to write out a mission statement. And the mission statement that you have within your organization is really important because it also helps the team identify what your vision is and where you want the organization to go. And everyone on your team should know what that mission statement is. And it should be what you want to be known for in the future. Um, and when you look at that, um, the other one you can look at is the rocking chair moment. So where you're sitting back on your rocking chair at the age of 95, what is it that you want people to know, know about you and also what you want to be known for? So it's a really important step in making your mission statement is to identify the true value of what you want within your organization and understand why you have set these goals for both your team and yourself. Keep in mind that the activities that you do to identify your mission statement should be also incorporate your team. And this is one of the things that we do at the strategic planning retreat with, um, with all of our clients and members is really identify what are your mission and what is your goals. Okay, understanding motivation and how to motivate your team. When you, uh, you can't always get into the head of another person, even if this were possible, understanding what motivates another person can be very complex. And even the pers that person is unaware of who, what their motivations are. However, to a certain degree, the essence of leadership is getting others to do 
what you need them to do as if it were their original motives themselves. While you may not be specifically able to identify another person's motives, there is a good rule of thumb that uh, was developed by Kenneth Burke called dramatization or dramatism. So the great Canadian rock band Rush once said, all the world's indeed a stage and we are merely the players. To be fair, they borrowed this notion from William Shakespeare, who noted that each person is like the star actor in their own play. Kenneth Burke developed this theory of dramatism based on this notion. If you understand that people see themselves as a star of their own drama, this can be the first step towards making a good guess of what their motivation is. If you can, at the very least, think in terms of how other people are motivated, you are better able to develop compassion for them. Have you actually asked your team what motivates them? Have you asked individually what motivates you and, and what gets you up in the morning? What makes you want to do your job each day? With compassion, you are better able to understand another person's needs and how to meet those needs while motivating the person to help meet your needs as well as your company needs. According to Burke, on some levels, most people in our society and culture are motivated, motivated by guilt. He uses this term loosely to include emotions such as shame, disgust, anxiety, and embarrassment. From this viewpoint, people act to try to avoid guilt um, and guilty emotions or to find redemption, which is what makes those feelings go away. It is this attempt to move from guilt to redemption that puts an individual's drama in dramatism. There are few factors that contribute to a large way to people's feelings of guilt and inadequacy. The social order in hierarchy, um, as people interact with each other, we consciously and unconsciously create a sort of pecking order through our language and concepts. This gives individuals a sense of relation to others in terms of being perceived as equals or as a superior or, or inferior to another person or group of people. The negative in this sense is an act of rejecting your place in the perceived social order. Burke used the term rotten or perfection, within perfection, to describe the situation where people realise that their place in a social hierarchy is to some degree arbitrary. Those who inhibit a superior position may feel guilt or anxiety because our language, um, our language includes a notion of perfection that is impossible to achieve in actuality. For example, Someone who is known for being particularly generous might experience shame or guilt for wanting to put themselves, him or herself first on an occasion. The idea of perfect generosity is unattainable, so the person feels guilty, pushing them to seek redemption. Conversely, someone in an inferior social position might realise that he or she is not as lowly as circumstances may bear. And this becomes motivation towards redemption. Being a victim is also another factor in this drama where the guilty person lays blame for her or his circumstance to on an external source, another person who or society condition. There are two types of victims, universal, which blames everyone and everything and fractional, where a person blames a specific group or individual. In vilifying the other person, the guilty person can assume a heroic role in this drama. So you really got to think about how people are acting and what are they doing within their role in life um, and within your organisation. Redemption is the final stage of the type of drama where the person purges guilt through a kind of death or either symbolic, um, as in a transformation in a character or a profession of one's sins or misdeeds, or in actuality by truly dying. It is uncommon and disrespectful, for example, to speak ill of the dead. 
Burke considered the redemption <clears throat> stage um, a transformation where one transcends from old order or societal hierarchy and a new order is created. You can look at Burke's transition from guilt and trans, uh, redemption as following two paths. The first begins with the status quo, followed by guilt or anxiety about one's place in the status quo, followed by identifying a scapegoat, followed confession and repentance, which leads to the transformation to the older into a new order. This description of move from guilt to redemption can be helpful in understanding how people come to actively dislike others. Often um, at the root of ill will is a feeling of inadequacy and guilt and in an individual. So it really gives you a better understanding of that culture within your organization. It's made up of so many characters that you have within your team and understanding who those people are within your team and what those characters are and what motivates and drives them, you're going to have a much more predict, uh, productive team. Another aspect of Burke's theory of dramatization is called identification. If you have ever heard someone say, or have you said it to yourself, I can really identify with this person. You're getting at the heart of what Burke means by identification. In some ways, it is the opposite of being a victim. When you identify with someone else, you are able to feel empathy and compassion for them. In identification, something of you rubs off on the other person with whom you identify, and something of that person rubs off onto you. In leadership, you can create an unconscious willingness to be led in another person by identifying with that person and trying to meet the other person's needs. When you go out of your way to an, an, allow an employee off for a vacation, he or she is excited about, you create in that person a willingness to follow you and make your goals their goals. Constructive criticism. And this is really important when you're working with a team. It's really looking at how at what and understand what motivates the people you are leading is a great way to better assist them but you also have other pressures upon you as a leader which can include your ultimate goal for your company as well as the pressure from higher up within your hierarchy what's more even when you are understanding and a compassionate leader some may seek to test this the difference between an understanding but effective leader versus a weak leader is how well you respond when people attempt their consciously or unintentionally um, to cross boundaries. When someone engages in behavior that's detrimental to your overall leadership vision, you occasionally have to intervene. What's important in this case is that you intervene in an effective way that makes the situation better for everyone involved. And it's really looking at how can you build a much more constructive team uh, based on uh, you know, feedback that you receive? When you have to criticize or correct an employee, one of the most important things to consider are your own motivations. While it may be tempting for you to punish an employee who acts up, this can frequently create poisonous environment where the employee misses the message um, of improvement and only hears the negativity and involves asserting your superior position over the employee. This can recreate a sense of parent-child relationship, which runs uh, a counter to seeing the other person involved as a person and equal who deserves re respect. Punishment often has unintended consequences as well. If you look at the number of criminals who leave prison only to return over a period of time, it becomes evident that punishment can harden someone into repeating behaviors as much as it can deter the person from those behaviors. Sometimes it is helpful to retreat from a potentially volatile interaction rather than addressing a person when you are angry. You can use an email to schedule a time to address an issue 
for example, which has the additional purpose of allowing you to restore your emotional balance. Ultimately, you're in conflict with an employee because he or she has crossed a boundary, whether it's a social boundary or one related to the expectations of work. The more productive and effective approach is to find a way to correct the behavior rather than finding a way to punish the employee. <clears throat> One way to approach an intervention where you need to let an employee know about an area of improvement or an intolerable behavior that needs to be corrected is to try to envision this situation playing out in such a way that there are no losers. Instead, you want to consider a way in which everyone has an opportunity to become a winner. For an employee who has trouble with being at work all the time, or um, this might be a powerful move that allows the employee to take greater responsibility in he, his or her life. An improvement then carry over into the long term. When you develop a positive vision of what a successful correction looks like, you are better able to stay out of punishment or blaming mentality that so can sabotage good intentions and well-meaning well criticism. I love this type of feedback sandwich where you have good news, bad news, good news. It is a great way to be able to give feedback with a positive notion. Experiencing criticism can be a very stressful situation and even giving the criticism can be very stressful for yourself. And the common approach towards hearing criticism is to prepare for defense. One way to soften another person's experience of your criti criticism is to use the idea of this feedback sandwich. Instead of telling people what they are doing wrong all at once, you can mix the negative with the genuine positive comments as well. It's important that these are genuine, however, or you can come across an insincere and manipulative, and, and manipulative uh, and lose any goodwill or trust you might have earned with your employees. Finding a positive thing to say about an employee who needs correction serves an additional purpose as well. Whenever you are angry at another person, a good tactic to help spur your thinking away from that person's faults is to consider something positive about that person. Having something good to say about an employee can help you to put the entire situation into a more manageable per perspective. When you set goals, it's important that you set a goal that is achievable and corresponds to a time frame. Similarly, when you intervene with an employee about an area that needs improvement, it is helpful to have a definitive view of success, as well as a time frame for when you can check back with the employees. This follow-up will work better when approached as a, how are you doing with this? Rather than, have you done this, what I told you to do, style of conversation. Furthermore, you should consider avoiding two types of extremes. Not following, up, uh, not following up at all and overdoing your follow-up by continually returning to the issue. And you really need to identify, well, what is stopping them from achieving this goal or this task that you have given them? Um, and what could be blocking them may be something, it could be something within your conversation and how you uh, relay the message to your employee. So it's really important that we're offering constructive criticism because it makes it seem as if there is no need for criticism at all. On the other hand, if you continuously come back to the situation that prompted the criticism, you put the employee into a guilt redemption type drama. If you follow up with your employee at a scheduled time and the employee has not shown any improvement, you can reassess the needs uh, and what needs to be done further. You can use this time to schedule another follow-up. Keeping you, your follow-up structured can help you avoid the pitfalls that can turn following up being invested in your employee's success into a form of harassing your employee. 
So it's really important that we um, consider the tone of when you're working with your employees. In your role as a leader or a manager, you will often find yourself in situations where you have to perform well, even when you're not at your best. One truth about effective leadership is that when you think when things go right, you will want to deflect the praise to your team members. But when things go wrong, it's all your fault. This can put you under constant pressure and some of your most uh, more socially conscious and astute employees might recognize this fact, but most won't. Nevertheless, employees and supervisors can forgive much uh, when you approach them with the right tone. You will often find yourself in a position where you need to get your employees energized and motivated to work hard and enthusiastically. One who has adopted the rule through fear paradigm will consider this the time to be, become forceful and aggressive, and this can frequently backfire. Instead, an effective leader uses inspiration and positivity to harness enthusiasm to employees. Lighting a fire is, isn't akin to burning down the house, so much as shining a light to guide your employees. Here are some suggestions for improving employees' enthusiasm. Share inspiring quotes, speeches, or ideas. While the movie, um, The Wolf of Wall Street is not a great example of ethical leadership, it does give a good idea of powerfully in, in, powerful inspiration and how it can foster enthusiasm within um, your employees. This is why coaches in professional sports like to give the win one for the Gipper style speeches. The upbeat music to get people going. Music that has good beat and makes people want to dance also helps to instill enthusiasm and a kind of spirit uh, within the team. Celebrate group and individual successes in order to foster a positive and forward looking moral. So one of the things that we do at Vivacity is we have a system where we can give tacos to other team members. So what we do is we highlight when another team member has been working within our values and we give them kudos by giving them a taco. Now these tacos are like reward points that they can gather and then they can use these re reward points to buy themselves something. So um, what we have is we have a range of different things like they could get a day off work, uh, they could get a gift card uh, that is um, something that they can spend like a Bunnings gift card or a Coles gift card. So they're different things that they can use to reward and they reward other team members through uh, living our values, but also for, for out, outstanding work within your team. And it works really well within our organization. I love it, I think it works, it works really well, but I also uh, love the fact that our team members are giving kudos to each other. If you're successfully engaging your employees, it is inevitable that small conflicts will arise. While it might be tempting to see these conflicts as a negative, and in truth, if they are allowed to rage out of control, um, they will have negative effects. The fact that people are engaged enough to get angry or tense shows that they are employing their creative energies, and that's a positive. However, when tempers flare, it takes a calm leader to be the eye of the storm and channel that energy in a positive way or calm it so that employees can function productively. Here are some suggestions on what you could do. Always address conflict from a place of calm. And I see it as a lever. So when you're looking at uh, when you're dealing with any conflict, and this can be with team members or with students, and it could also be working with partners, and it's keeping your emotions in neutral. So when you're dealing with conflict, don't get too emotional, keep it in neutral. And then that way you're able to have a clear head and clear mind and be able to focus on what counts. Um, so keep calm. You may have to take a time out or allow others to take time out from their anger. Try to do so from a place of empathy and understanding. Avoid calling out 
employees in front of others. For example, when two employees are in conflict with each other, send one of them on a break and while you discuss the situation with the other. Be sure and give each employee the chance to tell their side of the conflict and make sure you listen more than you talk. When you speak to your employees about conflicts, make sure you are specific um, and that you address the issue in terms of behaviour and not in terms of the employee's character traits. Discuss how the conflict affects the rest of your team, but avoid doing so with an accu um, accusation tone. Allow employees to give you their understanding of what caused the conflict rather than identifying the cause yourself. Additionally, allow employees to suggest solutions for resolving the conflict. If necessary and appropriate, act as a mediator between the two employees who have had conflict with each other. However, when doing so, make sure everyone can address each other from a place of calm and making sure you're keeping it in a neutral. Allow everyone involved to agree upon the appropriate action to take in order to restore the peace. Most importantly, communicate from a place of mutual respect for all parties involved. Often in the aftermath of a conflict, the parties involved may feel either embarrassed or they may feel resentment towards the other parties involved. Help to restore the sense of mutual respect by treating all parties with the same de degree of respect, regardless of any perception of their level of fault or culpability in the conflict. One idea that comes to us from a psychological approach of transactional analysis is that when people interact with each other, they tend to slip into preformed scripts based on how they have experienced authority from authority figures when they were children. These scripts can frequently allow people to engage in escalating behaviors that create vicious cycles of conflict. Transactional analysis recognizes three primary styles of behavior in social interactions. Child. A person's need to escape responsibility can cause them to slip into child mode, where they can act dismissive and rebellious. People operating in child mo mode often dismiss other people's criticisms and maintain an attitude that they are going to do what they want to do regardless of how others feel. Parent. When someone feels a need to assert control over a situation, often in a case where they feel powerless, they may slip into parent mode. From the sound of it, you might think this is an example of where someone has adopted the voice of reason. But more often than not, it is the voice of authority and not a uh, very reasonable authority at that. If you have ever experienced someone talking to you as if you were a child, that person was most likely operating in parent mode. Adult. The ideal mode to operate is in adult mode. Those who operate from this mode are concerned with reality as it is, rather than disregarding reality like someone might do who is operating in a child mode, or trying to control reality like someone operating in a, a parent mode. If the child, parent and adult mode behaviours are scripts that people slip into, what keeps people playing their roles? And how can someone slip out of the role? In transactional analysis, there are two types of transactions, complementary and crossed. A complementary transaction means the behavioural modes match up and can continue indefinitely. One person's child mode evokes another person's parent mode and things can spiral out, spiral out of control into perpetual conflict. In order to intervene, one person has to engage in a behavioural mode that doesn't complement the other's behaviour. This creates a cross transaction. When a transaction becomes cross, the destabil this destabilises the scripted, scripted behaviours where those involved seek to find a new complementary behaviour. Keep in mind in this scheme, parent to child and vice versa is complementary, but so is adult to adult. 
The way to change the script then is to someone to adopt an adult mode of behaviour. When this turns the transaction from a complementary transaction to a cross transaction, the other person seems to find a new equilibrium in a new complementary transaction. So they will in turn also assume the complementary adult role. When you lead others, you will find that they will rise and fall to the expectations you set for them. If you trust your team and act to be worthy of their trust, they will strive to be worthy of your trust. One of the most difficult habits to keep under control when leading others is the tendency to micromanage. As someone who has a great deal of responsibility within your organisation, as well as being emotionally invested, it is very tempting to try and do it all yourself. However, micromanaging, even for the most tireless of managers, is the kiss of death in being an effective leader. The dangers of micromanaging are manifold. Your employees will come to resent always having you looking over their shoulder, which can undermine whatever other positive uh, qualities you have as a manager. Another tragic consequence of micromanaging is that you stunt your employees' growth. In order for each employee to become the best they can be, you have to encourage them to find their own way. Sometimes they may not be able to do something in the same way that you would, and your standing aside may result in the failure. Keep in mind, however, that failure is often a prelude to success. We often need to fail, failure in order to succeed. Allowing an employee to make a mistake is akin to allowing that employee to grow and become better. Here are some suggestions to help you avoid the temptation of micromanaging. Develop a rule where employees cannot come to you with a problem unless they have thought of two solutions first to that problem. While having an open door policy is helping in building rapport with employees and it is useful in serving the needs of your employees, you must consider how useful you are being to those employees if you stand in the way of their growth. Consider limiting your employees access to you in some ways. One possibility is to allow a certain time of day for open access, while other times of the day are reserved for appointments only. Another suggestion is to resist the urge to jump in um, at any sign of difficulty. Instead, count slowly in your head to 10 and consider whether this is one of those times where your help is truly necessary versus one of those times where in helping your employees, you're actually hurting them. What frequently stops us from delegating responsibilities to employees is a fear that they may fail us. However, this distrust of our employees can be more damaging than failure itself. Living in fear keeps our lives in holding patterns and we never grow or allow others to grow. There is no re reason to be afraid of failure because it is inevitable in all of us. If, however, we are able to view failure as a learning opportunity, then we can become comfortable with the idea and learn to take risks. Here are some suggestions you can use to manage your trepidation about delegation. Write down your concerns rather than voicing them or allowing them to swirl in your head. This can help to ventilate anxieties. Manage your stress levels through exercise. When you do this regularly, you will tend to feel better physically, which gives emotions such as anxiety less room to take hold. Meditate regularly to practice staying in the present. Worry is a future orientated activity, but one over which you have little control. Appreciate and celebrate healthy progress over perfection. Our notion of a perfect situation, a perfect perform star, uh, task, or any other number of perfect things that we can imagine is actually a linguistic construction. Actual perfection 
is something that is completely beyond our control. We can only control how we react. We can't control the behaviours and what others do. Learn to recognise and counteract magnif magnification. A distorted thinking pattern where you imagine the worst possibility as the most likely possibility. Often when you feel in the grips of an arousal emotion, such as anxiety, you tend to think in shorthand in, and in images rather than a complete sentences. Identifying this shorthand, converting it into complete sentences and investigating the logic of that can help lessen your feeling of anxiety. For example, when you delegate an important task to an employee, your anxiety over the situation might prompt shorthand such as failure, disaster, poorhouse. Translating this into a complete sentence might look like, if my employee fails, I will be blamed for the worst possible disaster that can occur in this company. Then I will be fired, uh, fired and go on to the poorhouse. Now that you have translated the shorthand into a complete sentence, ask yourself if you would truly be fired over this or would you truly fire someone over this? Often you wouldn't have the level of responsibility um, if, you, if you really think about it. Uh, this is a really good term that one of my team members actually used recently, aces in their places. And this is something that I truly believe in. I believe that you should put your team members, um, position them in your organisation where their strengths lie. Um, and you'll get much more productive team members if they're working with their strengths rather than trying to and or expecting them to work in an area that they just don't understand. One more aspect of delegation can help limit your anxiety. You must delegate in a proper manner. Delegating tasks blindly or randomly can turn disastrous if the person you have delegated the task to is not suited to that task. Fortunately, one reward of getting to know your employees is that you can get an idea of what each employee excels at. Um, one of the things that we do is we do a, a team dynamics profile. So we profile each of the team members and we identify what are their strengths um, and how they work more effectively within a team and how you can work more effectively with your profile and their profile. And it works really, really well when you have an understanding of how people work best and what are their strengths within the team. By tailoring the tasks you delegate to your employees' strengths, you put them in a better position to succeed and their success is ultimately your success, even if you will inevitably give them all the credit. By putting your aces in their places, you will also foster a sense of belonging and importance to each member of your team. If an employee knows that he or she is in a role because you handpicked them for it, this will pay huge dividends in that person's own confidence, which helps to maximise their performance. Celebrating success. In order to get the most out of your employees, it is helpful to foster a culture of mutual celebration of success. And no success is too small to escape such a celebration. Take time out to recognize a job well done and you will encourage additional successes. Cultivating certain emotions in your employees, such as enthusiasm, optimism, confidence, and tenacity will help them to perform better and enjoy further successes. Avoiding micromanagement, delegating tasks properly and celebrating successes are all ways to increase your high regard and trust for your team. But trust is a two-way street. An effective leader is one whom the followers will trust implicitly. Trust, like respect, does not come automatically. Some people may be naturally inclined to trust people, but the degree of trust you need to lead effectively must be earned. The most important way to earn trust is to consistently be honest. This can even be helpful when admitting you are wrong or that you don't know the answer. 
Employees will respect someone who can admit vulnerability more than someone who tries to hide behind a veneer of perfection. Lying to employees, buttering them up with fake sentiment or taking credit for their successes are quick ways to make them distrust you. Once employees distrust you, your ability to lead them and effectively becomes near impossible. However, honesty should never be used as a weapon. You may occasionally have to tell an employee how it is, but this is exactly where considerations of tone and intent become vitally important. And this is what one of our values is, is being open and honest. We actually have that as a value within our team and we, um, I encourage it with our team as well. I'm open and honest with our team as well. And we have a much better rapport with the team members when we are open and honest. In addition to being honest, an effective leader will earn trust by being reliable in everything she or he does. Conversely, if you prove unreliable, employees will not trust you. This makes it vital to follow through on everything you say. If you indicate that there is a boundary that employees should not cross, you must address it when that boundary is crossed, even if it is with a mild response such as, don't do that again. If you say you will give an employee certain requested time off, then you must accomplish this. If you tell an employee you will follow up, then you must follow up. Being reliable also means being consistent. Ignoring one employee's misdeeds or successes is as bad as ignoring every employee's success or misdeeds. In some ways, it is even worse because it can communicate a sense of favoritism. The level of pressure and the amount of work you have before you may make it impossible to meet one of your commitments. However, you can lessen this re reality through adopting the following suggestions. Keep a well-organized calendar. You can do this um, by, you could also have a plan or a calendar, or you could use something like a Trello board uh, where you're managing your tasks where you're writing down your commitments, which is one of the reasons why we have the high value activities. Now you can do this with your team as well as doing it yourself. It's something that can work really well with everyone on your team. Make a point to acknowledge your receipt of the employee's requests in writing, but also remind employees that you must have requests in writing as well. Don't overpromise and under deliver. If you aren't sure if you can award time off, don't tell the employee that you can. One of the most important things you can tell an employee, and yet one of the most difficult, is that you don't know or you are not sure. While you may fear that this will undermine your employee's confidence in you, you can counter this with a statement that you will find out. Make sure that you follow up. However, if you do make that promise, if you find that you are unable to meet a previous obligation you made, make sure that you inform the other person as soon as possible. Sometimes an emergency may come up or the situation may change. You don't need to offer a full explanation most of the time, although in some cases it might be necessary and appreciated. But you do need to let the other person know as soon as possible and as soon as you know. If you have a meeting with an employee scheduled, Try at that point to reschedule it if required. Making yourself available to your employees is another vital aspect of building trust. This can be tricky. However, you, can, you have to use good judgment in determining how available you need to be in order to make yourself um, avoid micromanaging. Nevertheless, you should always allow time where employees can approach you. If an employee feels you are unapproachable or feels intimidated by you, it can create a situation where you are the last person to know about something important that is going on. And I'm sure you have experienced that in the past. I know I have experienced it as well. Have you ever experienced a time when you've terminated a team member 
and then all of the other employees come to you and tell you about how bad they are, the other the team member that you just terminated. And then you're like, why didn't you tell me before? This is where it's really important that the employee feels that they can trust you and know when they can come to you when you're available. While you want to encourage employees to not over rely upon you, you also want employees to feel that they can come to you when they need to. Striking the correct balance can take time and can vary from employee to employee. Some employees may develop better confidence in themselves by being left to their own devices. Others, particularly new employees, might need your presence a bit more. But it's best to think of yourself in the situation as being like training wheels on a bicycle. At some point, the training wheels need to come off. Even then, however, your employees will trust you more knowing that you will figuratively catch them if they fall by being supportive and constructive. It may seem as if openness is the same thing as honesty, but there is a bit more to it. Being open is a twofold characteristic. On the one hand, you want to be able to be upfront about your vision for your team, your plan for their success, and even when appropriate, what changes may be in store. Sometimes you may be in a position of knowing something that's going to happen and the circumstances won't allow you to inform your employees. However, if employees sense that something is about to happen, this can produce anxiety. Since changes in work can affect a person's livelihood, this anxiety cannot be overlooked or dismissed. Try to engage in empathy about the effect of keeping information from your employees. This can get tricky when trying to strike a balance between the needs of your employees and the leaders. But if you're operating from your own personal mission statement and using your own core values, then making tough decisions can actually be emotionally rewarding in that you get an opportunity to make a decision that you can make, be proud of. The other aspect of openness is being open to employees' feedback and criticism. They may not always be right in their criticism or concern, but respecting your employees may be giving them a fair hearing. When someone comes to you with a problem with what you are doing or how you are doing things, Listen carefully. If you feel yourself getting angry or defensive, it's possible that the employee has struck a nerve. You may not be in a place where you can immediately acknowledge the employee's criticism. If that's the case, schedule a follow-up that will allow you time to assess your employee's concern and what you can do about it. Recent studies have found that people appreciate vulnerability in others far more than an appearance of perfection or invincibility. So don't be afraid to admit when you are wrong or mistaken. This can actually make you a more respected and effective leader than if you demand respect by never apologizing or acknowledging your own mistakes. Teams don't immediately come together and experience success overnight. In fact, it takes a good leader to work at turning a group of people into an effective team. We are going to look at the various aspects of building and improving your team. One of the most important activities that you will need to engage in as a leader is constantly assessing the state of your team, each indi individual employee and yourself. Before you can put your employees in a position of success, you have to have a good idea of what their strengths are and what their weaknesses are. Here are some guidelines to assess a team member's strengths and weaknesses. Include other team members in the assessment process. Allow each member of the team a chance to identify both his or her and other team members' strengths and weaknesses. Ideally, this can be done privately so that no team member develops resentment towards another for perceived unwarranted criticism. This also allows you to compare your assessment with others. When an employee or the entire team experiences a failure or a success, try to identify how, why this came about. 
who was most responsible. In the case of failure, identify the responsible person is not about casting blame, but it is about identifying what went wrong so that you can improve your practices. And this is part of your continuous improvement approach throughout your organization. When you're on analyzing success, however, it is good to give credit when someone other than yourself was particularly instrumental in that success. Determine how consistently an employee performs in a given role. If that employee is consistently unsuccessful, try to find another opportunity and role for that employee to be successful. Identify the skills necessary for success in certain roles. And when an employee is um, consistently successful in the role, note these skills as part of the employee's skill set. If an employee fails to perform consistently, you may also identify the skills where their weaknesses are within that particular employee. Observe employees when they act alone or outside of the team structure in order to determine their strengths and weaknesses and how they might change in different contexts. Perhaps it is a, not a lack of a particular skill that is the weakness, but an inability to apply that skill in a team setting or vice versa. Dr. Meredith Belbin identifies nine team roles that can help make a balanced and effective team. The plant. The plant is the highly creative, unconventional member of a team. They tend to be strong in thinking outside the box, that, but their primary weakness is a tendency to be forgetful. The monitor evaluator. This person is a good at providing logical and dispassionate view of a range of decisions before a team. They tend to have difficulties with being overly critical and slow moving. The coordinator. This employee, often it will be you, helps the team to focus on goals and to delegate work effectively. They tend to either over delegate or under delegate and end up micromanaging. The resource investigator. This employee will tend to understand how your team work and can best translate to the rest of the world. They will be good at understanding your competition and developing connections with others outside and inside the team framework. But they can have difficulties with following up on or getting in-depth information. The implementer. This role involves someone who is good at taking theory and putting it into practice. They try to find strategies on how to make an idea work in the most effective manner. Implementers have difficulty considering alternative approaches and may be slow to give up on a favored idea. Completer finishes. These team members excel at the end of a task. They make sure everything is functioning ideally. These employees act as a kind of quality control. Their strengths have high standards, can also be their weaknesses, if in that they tend to be perfectionists. Team workers. These employees really are really good at smoothing over the transitions and difficulties um, of tensions that come up when people are working hard on creative endeavors. They excel at working and playing with others, but they can be indecisive when it comes to time to make team decisions about the best course of action. Shapers, these employees act as a kind of engine for the team. They can effectively get others going and create momentum. Typically, shapers are highly driven and enthusiastic in individuals. Their weaknesses tend to be uh, overly aggressive and temperamental in their desire to get the team's work done. The specialists. The specialists of the group might only know how to do one thing, but they are an expert at it. Their focus is narrow and in-depth, which can be both their strength and their weaknesses. An ideal team is well balanced with all nine roles being expressed. Since many teams are smaller than nine people, you might find it difficult um, to find all of those different members and how they excel at multiple roles. When you identify a key strength in one of your employees, 
for example, an employee who is highly energetic, that you can help them, then you can help them fulfill one or more roles on your team. The energetic employee, for example, might be good at being a shaper as well as being a resource investigator. Someone who is highly critical can either be, uh, could be a really good completer, finisher, or monitor, evaluator, or both. Often you may want to give team members a break from working on their normal projects to meet as a team and improve team morale or functioning. Sometimes getting a team member for a meeting or a team building activity can actually be an ex exercise in futility. In order to use team meetings and team building exercises effectively, it is helpful to have specific goals in mind to identify those goals to your team members and to follow up. For example, doing a trust building exercise after a time when team members were at each other's throats is helpful, but if you only do the trust building exercise the one time, after a while team members may forget the point or lose the benefits they gained from engaging the exercise in one time. When planning a meeting, for instance, identify why the meeting is necessary and plan an agenda uh, to the time for the uh, team members to play together and how are they going to work together and keep their meeting organized. Help your team members to recharge after a particularly grueling project, and then you'll have more productive team moving forward. It can also help them build more of a rapport for each other. Having specific goals for an activity does not preclude having an activity achieve multiple goals. When planning team building exercises, make sure that you don't undermine your attempt to improve your team. Here are some suggestions of what to avoid in team building. Make sure that your team building goals are relevant to the team's needs so that they are worth taking regularly time away from work to improve. Make sure that your team building activities are not only one-time affairs, but that they are consistently worked on to reinforce your goals for that exercise. While sports may and can be fun for your employees, they can also be destructive, particularly if it's not their strength as a, um, in that sport and they may find that they're uh, on a losing team instead of winning. If you are using team building exercises, try to incorporate them more frequently than once or twice a year. Incorporating these exercises monthly or weekly helps to reinforce your goals. And that's it for our team and leadership skills and what you need to know. Um, the best part we need to cover now is you are the boss of you. We've reached the point where you need to understand all the ins and outs of leading others. However, if you cannot lead yourself effectively, then you will never be able to get others to follow you. The most important habit that effective people can have, whether they lead others or not, is to be more proactive. Think of proactive as the opposite of reactive. Instead of having the world act upon you, you take action to make yourself into the kind of leader anyone would follow. If you have been working on a mission statement and identifying your core values, this question is probably not too difficult for you to answer. If you understand what you value in both yourselves and in others, then you can work on shaping yourself into the kind of leader you want to be. Keep in mind that developing into the kind of leader you would follow involves constantly reassessing where you are in terms of your values, your goals, and your overall vision. The further you go down the path of leadership, the more necessary it becomes to refine your skills and improve yourself. This requires both detachment and self-honesty. Being detached means that you are able to dispassionately observe where you are strong and where you are weak. Self-honesty is the capacity to identify personal strengths and weaknesses. 
in order to be an effective employee, an effective leader, and an effective person, you must have the capacity to reflect and be aware of yourself. Being self-aware involves multiple dimensions of self, taking care of your physical needs through exercise and maintaining a good diet are factors in being aware of physical self. Disciplining your mind through meditation that allows you to manage your emotions effectively is an example of developing your emotional and psychological awareness. You also want to have an idea of the big picture. Are you satisfied with where you are and where you are going? Imagine once again that you are at a funeral. How would you imagine the things people have to say about you would square with your life goals and your mission statement? Self-improvement is a long-term game, but as you work continuously on improving yourself, it is important to keep your certain pitfalls in mind. Navel gazing can occur when you become overly focused on yourself. This means that you can become self-absorbed and self-centered. Another pitfall of working to improve yourself constantly is that you can become overly convinced of your own self-importance. Finally, if you're always working to improve yourself, you may find that you've gotten stuck in the sense that you are never good enough. A better way to frame this is to think uh, that where you are is always good, but that there is always room for improvement. When you find yourself excessively self-orientated, this is a sign that you need to deepen your humility and refocus on serving others. Here are some su suggestions you can do to help foster a greater sense of humility. Allow others to be first and foremost. Insisting on being the first in line, the first to raise your hand in class, the first to get the parking spot and so on, has a tendency to inflate one's sense of self-importance. However, when you allow others to have the spotlight or be first, it gives you a better vantage point to appreciate their gifts and what they are able to bring to the table. And when you can do this, you can actually find yourself in a better position to lead others because you understand how they can best contribute. Don't insist on being right. Nobody likes to be wrong, including other people. When you are wrong, it puts you in a vulnerable position, which can be scary. However, vulnerability is often what makes a person beautiful and appreciable and approachable. Allowing others the legitimacy of their beliefs within, without correction from you is a charitable act. Listen to what other people think more than telling them what you think. Dale Carnegie once said that the sweetest sound to anyone is the sound of their own voice. Really paying attention to what other people have to say without having to correct or undermine helps them to understand and stay orientated outward rather than being self-absorbed. Try not to judge others. An old saying goes like this, when you point a finger at someone else, you point three fingers back at yourself. Whether it is tempting, while it is tempting to judge, you are presuming that you know better. And if you've ever heard the term, Assume makes an ass out of you and me. It's a really good phrase that you can use that really gets you thinking about assumption and assuming what others and what you think others know and understand. Unfortunately, unless you have lived the experiences of another person, you cannot know what is best for them. Your grasp on another person's situation will always be incomplete because you don't have the complete picture. Throughout the whole process of becoming a more effective leader and more effective human being, two tools can help smooth the way. The first is developing a greater sense of gratitude. When you wake up in the morning or while you drink your coffee or eat your breakfast, either write down in a notebook or type in your computer a list of five things that you are grateful for. This is also something 
that Tony Robbins teaches. And it really gives you a good understanding of what there is to be grateful for in your day. If you keep this gratitude journal every day, it will have a cumulative effect on your keeping your a positive outlook. The second tool is uh, tools importance cannot be understated. No matter how much you have on your plate at any given time, it is important to take time out to play. Whether this is a hobby such as painting or an activity such as playing video games, make a point of scheduling playtime for yourself at least two to three times per week. This will help you balance out the stress of your life. Words from the wise. Max Licardo, a man who wants to leave the, leave the orchestra must turn his back on the crowd. If your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more and become more, you are a leader. A leader is best when people barely know they exist. When they work, their work is done, their aim fulfilled, they will say, we did it ourselves. And Eleanor Roosevelt, to handle yourself, use your head. To handle others, use your heart. And that's it for today's uh, masterclass. I hope you got a lot out of that. Um, this has been recorded for our members and it will be available on Vivacity Training. Um, we also will have some other activities that will be going on to the uh, course online. So there will be some additional things that you could implement into your organisation as a leader um, within your team. So if you'd like to know more about the eight critical drivers to RTO success course, um, please get in contact with Vivacity. Uh, you can either email us at hello at vivacity.com.au or you could also get in contact with us on 1300 729 455 and we'd love to help you out with that. Um, we also have a courses membership. Uh, courses membership is where you can access all of our training, including all of the other eight critical drivers on an ongoing basis. And another course that we have is the TAS Superhero course uh, that you could also use as well. I hope you got a lot out of today and we look forward to catching up with you again next month. Next month, we're going to have a guest speaker joining us who will be, uh, will be delivering training on marketing and sales. So we'll be covering uh, the subject marketing and sales um, in the next uh, Critical Drivers. So we'll be going through that. And we're gonna have a special guest speaker who will be going through some techniques and tools that you can use for improving your search engine optimization and Google Ads. So it's gonna be a really good one that's going to be able to help you improve your, um, your branding and also your marketing online. So thank you very much for attending today. I look forward to uh, catching up with you next month and uh, see you soon. Thank you.